This is not the last event. There will be another one. And so this idea of having trusted sources of information available that you can turn to early in the event at a moment's notice, you need to have that in your hip pocket going forward. Welcome to the Rain Insights on COVID-19 podcast. I'm Emily Donahue. U.S. President Joe Biden said this week he wanted to meet the goal of 200 million vaccine doses before the end of his first 100 days in office. Some news outlets suggest the U.S. could be getting close to enough vaccines for the adult population. But disinformation is still rampant. In today's episode, Rain founder David Lawrence speaks with doctors Fred Southwick and Bill Lang about the latest statistics and how to identify reliable, science-based information about all of the available vaccines. Fred and Bill, once again, uh, thank you in advance for spending some time with us and going through the past week and what may be ahead. Uh, Let me start with uh, AstraZeneca, the vaccine, very much in the news. It was in the news a couple weeks ago because of uh, various reports, which thus far have turned out to be unfounded about blood clots, but uh, recent data around the efficacy of the vaccine. And maybe you can walk us through that and how people should be thinking about some of the results. I know there was a slight revision in terms of the the results that were announced just in the last day or so. David, what I thought was very interesting was if a week ago, if you typed into a browser AstraZeneca COVID vaccine, you would have had page and page and page of uh, stories of the European regulators shutting down because of the um, uh, a possible or asserted association with clots. And then later in the week, again, pages and pages and pages of articles discussing the fact that they used interim data to put, put out the news release with their initial results and how that was just awful. Well, then this week, the reports are that no, there is no association uh, that can be determined with between the vaccine and clots. And in fact, the incidence of clots appears to be less than in the the general population. Now, that's not statistically valid less, but it but they, there were certainly statistically there was no increase. And then uh, yesterday, actually late Wednesday night, uh, they re- they released the final analysis. Um, of the, the, it's the high level analysis. It's not the detail the FDA is looking at, but it is analysis based on the final data. And they found that the, um, the difference between what was reported based on the interim data and what the final analysis was, was a whopping three percentage points. They said it was 76% efficacious against preventing any disease. The, I'm sorry, initially 79. And in the final, they said, well, it was only 76 that's not a big difference. Um, so a huge tempest in a teapot, Temp- two tempests in a teapot. Yeah, they, Bill, Bill is exactly right. And, and, and the, the problem is our their various authorities want to look as though they're being very rigorous in analysis of the data and are setting off alarms inappropriately, unfortunately. They're overreacting. And the concern I have with the overreactions is this reduces trust. And I'm afraid the AstraZeneca vaccine will not be trusted by a large number of people because they have heard these negative uh, responses. And the human brain is more sensitive to negative uh, findings uh, and harm than they are to positive findings. And so this really does damage from the standpoint of confidence in the AstraZeneca vaccine. Well, and I'd, I'd actually take that a step farther. If you look at the uh, University of Washington uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, who has been put out some of the more, at least time-wise accurate models throughout the, the epidemic, one of the things that they've been looking at recently is uh, survey data on how many people will be willing to take a vaccine. That, they didn't ask, they were not asking specific vaccines. 
their their data now it's based on facebook surveys which are is, is are not great um uh procedurally surveys but they're getting less than 50 percent or right around 50 percent that are, are going to be willing to take a vaccine i mean that is just that's worse than we've been seeing i'm still for any calculations i'm doing i'm trying to assume that we're going to get um 75 percent acceptance rate of vaccine most people including cdc are saying oh, the number is probably around around 70 percent um, but that's something that we're going to need to do is really push the, the marketing, essentially, of the vaccine to overcome these fears that people have had for various reasons, whether it is, you know, historic um, uh, bad use of, of research technologies or news that is getting getting portrayed with a in a very bad light. Uh, but we're going to be we're going to be running out of people who want to take the vaccine here over the just the next few weeks. And what should the message be to the public to overcome this either reticence or some of the disinformation that's out there? Well, I think one of the most important concepts is the fact that if you get the vaccine, you will not be hospitalized and you will not die from COVID-19. And 100% of the different types of vaccines that are available in Europe and the U.S. fulfill that criteria, those criteria. Therefore, it, is a, it really reduces your stress and fear with regards to whether you contract the virus. If you have been vaccinated, you will not get serious disease, you will not be hospitalized, and you won't die. The other uh, important concept that's still not fully published, but I think is going to come true, and I'd be interested in, in Bill's uh, take on this, but based on the Israeli data, which so far is only in the newspapers, if you are vaccinated, at least with Pfizer, your ability to spread infection to others if you were to come, become exposed uh, is markedly reduced to the point that it's you have a, uh, a 6 to 4% chance that you could ever spread the virus to someone else. What that means is if you're going out to work, you're becoming exposed. If you're vaccinated, you cannot bring back the virus to your family. And this, I think, is a really important benefit that is not fully uh, vetted from a research standpoint, but I believe will turn out to be correct. Well, and what I've seen, and again, I haven't seen the papers, just just seeing that it in that reported in the news, is that this that's been corroborated by studies in the in the United Kingdom. And the other benefit there is we know that the UK has had a um, almost entirely the UK variant at this point, and they're fi they're finding that it is protective. It is 100% protective against serious disease and hospitalization. It is 95 ish percent protective against any disease and similar 95-ish percent protective against infection and infectiousness. So uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing that and we're not seeing a whole lot of commentary in the U.S. scientific literature, which is surprising me. Yeah, I, I, as being an infectious disease physician for several decades now and, and seeing the efficacy of other vaccines, I regard these vaccines as a true miracle in that they their effectiveness is so incredibly high and their safety profile so far is among the best we have ever had. So I, I regard these vaccines as a true miracle and, and really I would encourage everyone to become vaccinated. I think one of the reasons there may be a little bit of reticence that grows is that it is very common to have to feel a little lousy the day after, especially the second vaccine. I don't know if I would go as far as say as more people than not, but a lot of people feel a little bit lousy. And historically, when you have reactogenic vaccines, meaning vaccines that make you feel bad, um, that does decrease the uptake of the vaccine. But I've had very, very few patients who have had more than just feeling a little fluey and need to take a Tylenol. Um, beyond that, people do very, very well with this these, any of these vaccines. Yeah, and, and Bill, the good news is if you have that, mild, that relatively mild side effect, 
that tells you that your body is reacting to the vaccine and that you are going to have a very strong protection from the vaccine. So in one way, it's a little uncomfortable, and the other, but on the other hand, it uh, is good news that your body is reacting in the expected fashion and is going to generate really a strong immune response. So let me just take a moment, because I want to summarize these points so uh, they're clearly heard uh, by the audience. Uh, number one, well, there's a lot of coverage around the comparative efficacy of whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, obviously we're talking about other vaccines and it might even be the Russian vaccine or Chinese vaccine, but put that aside for now. But what I'm hearing both of you say is that irrespective of the percentages that are thrown around, 100% effective in keeping people out of the hospital and 100% effective in keeping people alive irrespective of which vaccine you take. David, that's exactly right. Yes. Exactly. And, and I, I always say, say in medicine that I never say always or never, but I think it is fair to say in this case, it certainly approaches always protective. And what I would underscore for the audience is uh, these are not just doctors who are prescribing that people take the vaccine. They have taken the vaccine themselves. The other thing is that to the extent there are any side effects, they've all by all reports, they have been minor, relatively minor, uh, very, very short term. And what I'm hearing both Fred and Bill say is that very often that is an indicia that the vaccine is having its appropriate effect, at least after the second one, and that you are being protected. Am I David, understanding to, that correctly? Yeah. Yes. To be, to be fair, there have been sporadic reports of some immune complex related disease, but very, very, very small numbers given the, the well, as of, as of today, roughly 140 million doses that have been given. Um, there are in the U.S. alone. There are some reports of uh, things like uh, kidney problems with where immune complexes are are deposited in the kidneys. But these are very rare. They happen. You know, they're going to happen with with any type of uh, vaccine, generally speaking. But the complication that complication rate is so infinitesimally small compared to the risk of getting disease and having a severe outcome from the disease. Yeah, the other serious side effect was immediate hypersensitivity reactions, and the several were reported in, in Great Britain early on. But now that we've had a larger experience uh, and an analysis of 10 million uh, doses of vaccine from Pfizer, the 4.1 cases per million of uh, immediate hypersensitivity or anaphylactic reactions. And for Madeira, I think it was about 2.5 per million. This is exceedingly, exceedingly rare. And uh, just being on a plane near peanuts would have a higher percentage uh, anaphylactic reactions than this vaccine. We'll get back to our conversation in just a moment, but I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know about a way you can get critical information on the COVID-19 pandemic delivered daily. Subscribe to RAIN's COVID-19 solution. Track key developments around the virus's transmission, economic and operational impacts with critical news analysis and commentary to help formulate your own policies, procedures, and response plans. Learn more at RAINnetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E network.com. Now, let's get back to the podcast. I'm also hearing from both of you, also including the conversations we have offline, that as people think about, uh, obviously this has been a, a, a terrible year and tragedies where lives have been lost as well as impacted uh, significantly. But as people begin to put this vaccine in context with other vaccines, things that we we have from our childhood on to the flu vaccine to as people get older, the need to protect against pneumonia and other things from an efficacy standpoint and a side effect standpoint and a risk standpoint. These are vaccines that people should 
not be worried about and are among the safest and the most effective that have been produced in, in modern history. Yeah, David, I would agree. And what we try to think about is risk benefit. Here, the risk is exceedingly low. The benefit is huge. So if this is one of the largest differences between risk and benefit of any treatment I've, I've had anything to do with. And David, the other thing that you know, many people say, well, I don't want to take a vaccine that you know, was, was invented and developed and tested in less than a year. That's not the case. I mean, this, these vaccines, they really started, the bench research is years and years and years old, but, but starting a uh, vaccine related to coronavirus started with SARS and MERS. So there was a huge amount of research that was done. It was just the home stretch that was done in the last year. Uh, I wanted to take a moment, just continue reports about potential variants and uh, what people are seeing, what's developed over the last week and what we should be looking for now. In the United States, the biggest and very important point is that the variant that we're seeing is almost entirely the UK variant. And while the UK variant may be somewhat more infectious, somewhat more virulent, it is susceptible to all of the various therapies and vaccinations. So um, we don't we don't need to change course. We're just continuing the course. That doesn't mean that we ignore the other variants that may be developing. Uh, we continue to we need to maintain surveillance, um, need to maintain studying and looking for ways that we could mobilize uh, treatments and vaccines quickly should there be a change. But none of that is applicable right now. Yeah, I, I agree with Bill. But one of the concerns I have is that uh, a number of governors have backed off uh, in infection control measures that will prevent the spread of the virus. And in order for their new variants to develop, um, it requires that new people become infected. And the more people that become infected and the, uh, the, the longer that elevation and infection rate uh, persists, the more likely we are to have a vaccine, uh, uh, a variant that escapes the vaccine. Now, what's going on is as more people are vaccinated, the actual selective pressure for a variant that actually can override the vaccine will is more likely to become selective. That's why um, when a governor decides to stop mass mandates and allow everybody to go to small enclosed areas at a normal crowding, they're really playing the game of Russian roulette. And the probability is, if this continues, that we could select for a variant that will escape the vaccine. Good, good news, so far, that has not happened. Well, and, and the other side of that, and you're certainly more the expert on this than I am, is that the fact that we're seeing the vaccine is preventing infection and infectiousness, which was not, which we did not know initially, decreases that pressure to some extent. It doesn't eliminate it, but it decreases it to some extent because the vaccine, the, the virus just isn't developing in people. Yeah, I, I absolutely, absolutely. One of the things, Bill, you know, as we all have talked about, there seems to be this... Uh, resistance against wearing masks. Well, as long as, so give those people that don't wear want to wear a mask, get them a vaccine immediately. And uh, we can accomplish uh, much more with a vaccine than, than the other measures. So the more quickly we can vaccinate everybody, the better. And the fact that we're vaccinating so rapidly at this point is great. But as we've talked about already, uh, the hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy, is going to be the concern. And if we can't get above 70, to, probably 80% vaccina uh, people vaccinated, we can't really uh, break the back of the epidemic and, and really uh, stop the spread. So we really all depend on everybody taking the vaccine, and then we will all be protected. So apropos the point about vaccine hesitancy, some interesting data has come out and that disinformation continues, but disinformation may be spread by a relatively small number of people and yet obviously has a, a viral impact. 
would love to get your views on the current landscape of mis or disinformation. One of the ones that's been blowing up on the internet is that uh, the swabs that are used for the all the various tests are treated with ethylene oxide. That is the most common commercial high volume uh, sterilize, sterilization that is used um, in the U.S. probably around the world and. The, it's one of those chemicals, like so many chemicals, that uh, has to carry the legend, you know, this, this chemical is known by the state of California to cause cancer. Well, yes, in, in, uh, at rev- relatively high volumes over prolonged periods of time, it has been associated with certain types of blood cancers. That is very different than the residual amount of ethylene oxide that happens to be left on a nasal swab when it is passed in your nose for a few seconds and then pulled out. Totally different things. And yet this is blowing up on the internet that that this is just a, a scheme to give people cancer. That is not true at all. Yeah, another rumor that's been uh, fairly common is that the vaccine will uh, make you sterile. And the, the spike protein which the vaccine uh, induces the immune response to, the spike protein has no homology, in other words, no identity with any human protein involved in, in uh, fertility. And so this is another uh, grossly false rumor that should be uh, laid to rest. I think, David, one of the uh, points that uh, people are making is that there are a small p- number of people can do a huge amount of damage if they have a large number of followers. We've seen this uh, with some of the talk show hosts, and we've seen this with those that are really uh, followed in social media extensively. And my understanding is that actually Google, Twitter, Facebook are actually being called the task uh, as we speak of why they are not shutting down these few people that are causing all this damage. Um, it's what we call yelling fire uh, inappropriately when there is no fire. And I think one of the most important things that that organizations can do to combat this, and I, it's funny, I went back to one of the first um, uh, writings that I did on COVID over a year ago. Job number one is find a good information source, stick with that information source, and pr- and put that information out to your um, to your workforce or your organization, whatever it may be, so that people have a a trusted, reliable, up to date source of information throughout it. Because the only way you can combat misinformation is through true good information. Yeah, one of, one of the problems is generally the CDC had been the source for reliable information with any kind of infectious agent or epidemic. And unfortunately, uh, during the last three or four years, because of politicization, the, some of their voices were stifled or actually blocked from expressing the truth. And so as a consequence of that vacuum, I think other people have been able to fill in who are not experts and that do not understand infection or infection control and uh, pathogenesis. And unfortunately, I think we have all suffered the consequence of that. It's no coincidence that the the United States, with 4% of the population, has over 20% of the deaths, and we have by far the most deaths of any country in the world. So let me um, revisit something we discussed in some of the earlier podcasts. For those people who don't want to go to the CDC or want to go to additional sources other than those that are linked with the government, including state uh, health department sites, et cetera, uh, where would you guys recommend people look? I. Uh- that's a that's a tough question, David. Because I as I've I've seen it's changed uh, across the course of the pandemic. What I've tried to do for the most part from my end is look at look at data and not so much the analysis. Um, so and for that, my favorite my favorite source of data has been actually the Washington Post. They've had just a wonderful 
compilation of data as we go. But then for analysis, I, I've, I've tried to look at some of the, um, the, the academic literature, but even then there have been problems with the academic literature becoming politicized. So it's almost like you have to take everything with a grain of salt unless it is you know, hard numbers. Yeah, the, the Infectious Disease Society of America has tried to create a very rigorous site, uh, particularly for various treatments. And for instance, they came out uh, against hydroxychloroquine far before anyone else uh, because of a rigorous analysis of the data. So the Infectious Disease Society of America website is another place, although it tends to be quite technical. And I would agree with Bill, the Washington Post, the New York Times, both have been very accurate. As far as news, uh, TV news, I think ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, CNN, and MSNBC all have, in my view, been very, very accurate and very reasonable in their approach to the epidemic. Okay. Uh, I want to weigh in a, a couple things as well here for people. Um, Johns Hopkins, I think, has done a very, very good job. Stanford University Medical Center, Mayo Clinic. And you have publications, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, um, The Economist, Financial Times. I'm just trying to cover the spectrum of how people... Yeah, Atlantic is very has some very yeah. uh, in-detail articles right. that have been very insightful. And uh, the other thing I would just say to people, because I, I, I'm going to... Sees on your point, Fred, about sensational information, how people remember it and look at it. The important question that I think people have to ask, number one, when people are putting out information, and by the way, some of this is unbelievably expertly and professionally produced, uh, some of these infomercial type things, and they, they feel very authoritative and, and well-documented, and, and people will put credentials up there that, uh, quite frankly, convey a great deal of credibility. And just David, continue I, to urge urge people to have a healthy degree of skepticism. Remember, this is COVID. Is yes, it's the worst epidemic event we've had in in you know, since probably since the the flu the flu of the early twentieth century. But at the s same time, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had the anthrax attacks, we've had multiple biologic events. Um, over the past 20 years, in fact, averaging about once every seven years or so. And there is no reason to believe that that will not continue. Every time something happens, we think, okay, we put that behind us. But I think what organizations need to, to keep in mind is that this is not the last event. There will be another one. And so this idea of having trusted sources of information available that you can turn to early in the event at a moment's notice, um, maybe even you know, people are going to be hypersensitive to things now, maybe even so it's people who can say, no, don't worry about this one right now. You need to have that in your hip pocket going forward. Uh, any closing thoughts, what we should be thinking about in the coming weeks ahead? Obviously, we have a number of religious holidays. People will be thinking about gathering together. I'm hearing you say, irrespective of whether you've had this vaccine, um, uh, or the second vaccine and the period of time has lapsed, uh, still have to exercise appropriate caution, not just for yourselves, but for your loved ones. But any closing thoughts? Well, I, David, the one, I would like to end on an optimistic note. Uh, uh, remember, we have this incredible tool now, the vaccine, and it's going to be opened up over the next several weeks to everyone um, uh, 18 and older. And what will happen when we get the younger people uh, uh, vaccinated, the spread is going to dramatically decrease. What we did, and I agreed with the strategy originally focused on those that would uh, suffer the most harm if they were infected. Many of them were actually not spreading the infection, but suffered the consequences of others spreading it to them. Now, when we go to the younger age group, we're going to shut down the source of the viral spread. And hopefully we will get below a reproductive rate of zero in the, uh, by, my hope is by June. And if we could do that, if everybody will uh, uh, go, be concerned with their fellow man and take the vaccine, 
uh, we could uh, go back to a relatively normal life uh, by the end of June, hopefully. Now, the other concern is if we don't achieve herd immunity, the, uh, vac- the epidemic will smolder. There will be a long tail and we will never really be allowed to uh, bring down our guard or to f- return to a totally normal approach to life. So this is a very important period and we really need to guard against disinformation and we need to encourage all of our friends and family to be vaccinated. And the last point that I, I agree with everything he said, and the last point that I'll make is uh, we have not in several uh, weeks talked about treatments, but because unfortunately the disease continues, but there are some uh, treatments in the wings. They're not, they're not ready yet. We still really only have the three treatments that are steroids, um, remdesivir, and monoclonal antibodies, several versions of those. But there are some, some antiviral treatments that are in the wings that the preliminary data is just looking phenomenal on, better than Tamiflu for flu. Bill, I think that's a great point, and I'd actually like to address this um, in our next podcast. Just I'd like to further acknowledge all these people who are working on the front lines in administering the vaccines, and because it does take a village, and they're incredible volunteers now who are coming forward. And uh, I'm aware of uh, people out of our fire department here in New York who are administering the vaccines, and uh, it's it, it's very interesting. There's almost um, this volunteer army that seems to be coming out across the country to help roll this out. So, thank you guys very very much as always for these insights and your honest sharing of knowledge. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Dr. Bill Lang is an expert in public health responses to biological incidents, including pandemics. Dr. Fred Southwick is an infectious disease specialist at the University of Florida College of Medicine. Individuals and organizations turn to RAIN for risk intelligence that cuts through the hype to focus on what they need to know, what to expect, and what to do. You can sign up for our coronavirus solution to get critical information on the COVID-19 pandemic delivered daily. Visit us at rainnetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E network.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening. <laughs>